So what do Paris Hilton, Richard Hatch, and Snooki have in common? They're tabloid fodder. And they're also, their breakthrough as a reality TV stars may not have been possible if not for a show celebrating a milestone tonight. I'm talking about the first modern unscripted reality series, MTV's The Real World, which starts its 25th season. Can you be myself around you because I know you have a boyfriend? I don't want you to end up being the bad guy. Mm -hmm. Oh, how far we've come from the stripped-down original season in 1992. Seven strangers picked to live in a house and have their lives taped. There are concerns about how the real world can stay fresh after so long. Now there's just one show in a genre that has exploded. Now, the real world was once the winning formula for reality TV. Real people, real conversation in a believable situation. But when the concept of reality TV caught on, reality started to fall by the wayside. Survivors ready? Go! Survivor ripped away the backdrop of real life, flying its cast members to faraway places and turning them into contestants. Suddenly, reality became something from which you could be voted off. I've never loved somebody the way that I love Jesse. The Bachelor twisted reality a bit more, taking away the idea of average people and instead pitting 30 hand-picked hotties against each other in a quest for never-lasting love. In Beverly Hills, it's who you know, and I know everyone. Well, how do you top that? Well, with beautiful housewives, of course. The real housewives of Beverly Hills in the ramping up and camping up of reality TV. You could be the toast of the town one day and a nobody the next. But Jersey Shore, yeah, well, that takes it a step further. Give me a shot. Look at the jacuzzi area. Nicole ends up being like all over everybody. Stoking the stereotypes and using controversy to grab viewers. So if this is the state of reality TV today, is there any reality left? Or is it just TV? Now you may think you know reality TV, but Jennifer Posner is an actual expert. She spent 10 years watching and studying about 1,000 hours of reality TV. She's the author of Reality Bites Back, The Troubling Truth of Guilty Pleasure TV. Jennifer's in New York. Jennifer, what does 1,000 hours of reality TV do to your brain? Well, you know, if you have media literacy tools while you're watching, hopefully it doesn't rot your brain and it results in a fun, accessible book. But I wouldn't recommend it, I, I tell you. Um, it definitely is a, re a recipe for therapy, I can well, tell you that. I, I can only imagine, I mean, and I, I, I only watch a little bit of reality TV, so I'll, I'll, ad I'll admit that straight off the, the get-go here. I'm curious to know, it always strikes me as we look at the evolution of reality TV that there's a race to the bottom here in terms of about how offensive we can be, how shocking we can be. Have we, has reality TV reached the bottom? You know, there's always a new bottom for these bottom feeders to sink to or to race to. Um, it doesn't seem like they're racing there. It's actually their formula. So, um, I mean, basically, once Who Wants to Marry a Multimillionaire hit Fox in the year 2000, and then shortly afterwards, Survivor hit CBS that same year, uh, MTV's real world began looking really quaint. Uh, network television suits decided that the best way to woo product placement dollars and viewer eyeballs was to create controversy to, uh, quote unquote, piss off people at the NAACP, piss off people at the National Organization for Women, and therefore uh, get people to tune in to see what outrageous, crazy new thing was going to happen. The problem is, in the beginning, just saying that women are pathetic enough to you know, feel like they're losers if some guy they've never met before doesn't pick them for engagement was enough to, consider, to be considered scandalous. Now, you keep having to lower that bar. So then it's, okay, let's make all of those women seem like they're just promiscuous ghetto whores on Flavor of Love and play to all of the worst stereotypes about women of color that we have. Then it's, oh, let's, let's give them all extreme makeovers and force them to have, you know, 15 surgeries within just a few weeks. But Jennifer, um, well, and, and I, and I, I take your, you know, I take your point about the extremes that they're going to, but why are audiences following there? Why are people saying, look, this is ridiculous. I'm out of here. Well, you know, that's an interesting question. There are some shows that undeniably have huge ratings like American Idol or Dancing with the Stars, uh, undeniable hits. But 
many, many reality shows do not have those kinds of big ratings. Networks and producers will say, oh, we're just giving the public what they want, and if they don't like reality TV, they'd vote with their remotes. But when we do vote with our remotes and give those shows very low ratings, they often get second, third, fourth seasons anyway because they're 50 to 75 percent cheaper to make than scripted programming. And so scripted shows with more viewers often get canceled much more quickly than many reality shows that don't perform well. NBC's Jeff Gaspin, former Jeff Gaspin, said that the economics of reality television are so phenomenal that they can support a lower rating. Hmm. Well, here's my suggestion then. People should read your book instead of watching those shows and they won't have to worry about brain rot. There you go. I think that would be a great... You know, if everybody who w bought Snooki's book would buy Reality Bites Back, I think we'd have a much more media literate culture. <laughs> right on. Jennifer, great to talk to you tonight. Thank you. Thank you.